Well, hi, everyone. and Welcome to the space. And thanks for joining H and Powerhouse podcast session. I'm Joyce Young. I'm a photographer, film producer and podcaster. Very thrilled to be partnering with H and on this podcast. Co-hosting with me is Nicole, founder of H and NFT. It's a beautiful collection with artwork by Mr. Hype and celebrating diversity and female empowerment while focusing on building community. Our special guest today is Kelly Mee Lee, entrepreneur, producer and mental health advocate, star of Bling Empire on Netflix. And so before we start, I also want to pass the mic back to Nicole and just give a little bit more background about H and for those who are just joining in. So- my name is Nicole. I'm the founder of Asian NFT. So we have 8,888 beautiful Asian women in the Ethereum blockchain. It's really happy to have this podcast here and to have Kelly Mili here. So looking forward to know more about you and also your journey. Well, thank you guys so much for having me. Yeah. This is all very exciting. First of all, you know, you have a room full of amazing, strong women here. So I'm really happy to be part of it. And uh, obviously, Nicole, for introducing me to Asia. And I'm just excited to learn more as well. Well, thanks for joining. And first of all, congratulations on your recent launch of Bling Empire 2. Can you tell us how you got involved and started with this TV show concept and uh, other shows and films as well? This project has been a labor of love. It's been a long process. I first read the book, Crazy Rich Asians, about 2013. And when I was reading the book, I was like, oh my God, these are all fictional characters of my friends. So I started developing the project. It was very, very hard just because it's never been done before. All Asian cast on script the show in mass media. It definitely took a while. But obviously, we have to think Seth's Crazy Rich Asian, the movie, obviously Fresh Up the Bowl, and tons of other Asian cast show who has opened the door for Blame Empire. Very grateful that we have such a, a global fan base and partner like Netflix, so we're able to reach globally. Hopefully, more representation and more successful shows like Blame Empire will be able to open other all Asian cast shows and projects. For sure. We're so, just in general, so excited to see more Asian representation on uh, TV and film. Tell us a bit more about that. Um, how do you feel about it? Finally, getting more Asian representation on TV. I think we still have a very, very long way to go. We're so underrepresented in the mass media. Growing up in the U.S., I moved here at a very young age when I was about nine and a half, ten years old from China. And at that time, it's not like this now. Internet really wasn't there, so it's hard to transform information. You know, when I was reading magazines, watching TVs, movies in the U.S., we had no representation. As an Asian American kid growing up here, even though I was a U.S. citizen, I still feel like I didn't really belong here. You know, having Asian representation is very, very very important in a global market, but obviously in the U.S. just because that's where I'm from. So I'm just very, very, very proud and grateful for that, for this opportunity. Obviously, it doesn't represent all of our Asian community. All of our Asian culture is only a part of it just because Asian Asian culture is so vast. But, you know, we try our best to mix it up a little bit. So, yes, you get the glam, you get the fun, you get the drama. But at the end of the day, you know, this show, you can see some real life problems that everybody deals with. So like my relationship issue, generational trauma, Asian culture, infertility finding real parents those stories are very important to share and also it helps break stereotypes and push boundaries right? just because in the mass media Asians are tend to have stereotypes like we're very good at math or we're, we're not very vulnerable because we don't talk about our problems and we seem to like have a, everything kind of together-ish so I think these sh- shows hopefully will help break ba- uh, break barriers and Asians can be looked cool in the mass media yes that's amazing and uh, just great to see that and as you mentioned just so much you know from this show and the, you know combination of all the shows just different aspects and not seeing just kind of yeah the stereotypical or more one-dimensional type of Asian that you know people have that image right so it's good to see different angles more importantly as you mentioned the real life problems I mean there's a lot of common problems that, as human beings have so it's great to kind of see that come through as well from the beginning as you meet different people do you feel it's very well received I mean even outside of the Asian community is how's the reception from everyone else the show generally was very well received obviously season one hit top 10 and it was aired in 192 countries season two obviously I'm still waiting for the day uh, hopefully we have you know more seasons to keep, keep expanding the story and the journey with uh, this project even though I created this project right now I've, when, once you sell it to a, a big network a lot of people's hard work and a lot of people has hands in it for us I, I think everybody's trying to do their best to keep it authentic as possible and bring a balance to it right so bring a balance like I said it was just like you know, hopefully we'll make people laugh and hopefully there's some fun and over top moments but have also some heart to it as well amazing and I do want to uh, speak to um you mentioned you created on the series can you talk a little bit about the challenges of that as well when you first brought up the project i have to break barriers and what are the key challenges how to how did you kind of overcome that i think the beginning the key challenge is really having people believe in this project because end of the day you know everybody normally when you pitch to a network it's a corporate structure so people tend to have to be careful as well because their jobs on the line if they green light a wrong project or a project that's not successful so that was definitely challenging just because it's never been done before i'm really grateful that netflix took a chance on us and then there's 
was like a huge team of other producers, crew member, our cast. So it's really it's army done. I'm sure, there's so many little different details that there's a challenge every day, right, to get it going. And actually, that's not unlike you know nowadays when we look at the Web three and NFT and want to kind of pass it to Nicole. I mean, that's that's a you know huge props to Nicole. Uh, I'm a holder, of course, and following the Asian and just kind of starting up that world. That's also kind of hard to break through. I mean, Nicole can speak a little bit about that and how you get it started and kind of some challenges and how you overcome that. Yeah, for sure. So I think be- before that, I'm actually really inspired of what you're doing, especially like with Bling Empire. I relate to the movie so much. It feels like we are putting like Asians on the map. That is something that I'm really proud of to see like, our Asian culture because I'm from Malaysia, right? So I do relate a lot in terms of like the scenes. And then there was a lot of times like even like favorite one was like the palm reading. So although we kind of look towards like the west but then we still believe in like feng shui and like karma and like you know all these um, asian beliefs to talk about my journey in this space because i was in the nft space for quite some time when i discovered about nfts i was diving into it and then i realized that a lot of the projects were really male dominated and there wasn't any asian projects out there so i was like where are all the asian women projects and there were none of them so this is where i wanted to start my own back then the gender ratio in nfts was like i think 90% or even like more than that I wanted to onboard more women in the space into crypto because this is the future so there is no other way than to create beautiful Asian women representing all of the Asian cultures embracing all of the different tradition cultures colors that we have in Asia so that is what inspired me to start my own so I would say in terms of exposure I mean when I put out my website and my story out there I think it wasn't well received a lot of the times people do come back to us um, this was back then before we sell out they say that oh I don't think people would like that because we are all about gender neutral and and people prefer like animal PFPs or they prefer guys PSPs and things like that and then a few of like kind of like the crypto or, or NFT influencer even told me that I wouldn't make it. This is not gonna gonna work in this market, right? But obviously I proved them wrong. And the Asia market is huge. I mean, Asia is huge. And even in terms of our different like heritage and cultures, because in our collection, we have Chinese culture, we have the Japanese, the Korean culture, the, the Indian culture, and then we have like Malaysian traits as well. We have a whole variety of traits. And my whole goal is to educate people about Asia and the cultures because I look at other NFT projects and they're like, oh, it's an Asian NFT, right? And I look at their traits and it's, just, it's like a Japanese flag and they call that Asia. So <laughs> that is not Asia. Asia is huge. We have so many other different cultures in it. So that is Asian. So I would say in terms of exposure, it was kind of tough as well because everyone was so used to the animal PFPs and whatnot I started with going on to Twitter spaces a lot I was talking about Asia because I realized that not a lot of people are that fortunately able to like visit Asia you know because most of the NFT members they are based in the west and a lot of them they didn't even know like where is Malaysia and they thought that it was part of Singapore and stuff like that so that was really interesting for me to share awesome it's amazing amazing to hear the journey every time I hear you talk about just so much barriers have to break right and and just you know kind of also listen into Kelly's story in terms of producing and getting Asian stories done you have to do so much to kind of break the barrier and, and do it Kelly also uh, kind of coming back to you you're also a holder of Asian and kind of getting into the NFT world I want to get your thoughts of, of the Asian NFT and just the overall cut and how do you feel about the getting into Web3 as well well I really have to thank Nicole for this because she <laughs> introduced me obviously to this collection and I just thought it was so powerful again it's such a male dominated industry and she's able to create this collection that highlights Asian women and all the beauty and the characteristic and the personality through this collection I thought was so beautiful I'm very very new to the NFT space and I'm sure you guys can are all a lot more knowledgeable than I am so I'm very excited to learn from you guys as far as you know web 3 goes the same kind of you know it's kind of the same thing I, I you know I'm just really excited to see where it's gonna it's gonna go it's very very exciting this space right now because at the, at the very beginning I have no idea where it's gonna go but this is something that that's very, very exciting. And I'm really looking forward to see the future of it. Awesome, for sure. Yeah, it's changing every day. I mean, I started in February and uh, every day I'm learning new things, new acronyms and, and just kind of new ideas coming out of the Web3. So it's for sure very exciting. I mean, Kelly, you reinvented yourself quite a few times. Can you take a step back and talk about the other, I guess, industries and careers that you've been in and how did you pivot and reinvent yourself each time? So funny, when I talk about my career, I just feel like I have like commitment issue or something because I just change so much. <laughs> um, so my whole family are doctors. My mom, like the Asian mom she is so I was going to follow her footsteps my dad's footsteps uh, to become a doctor until I started biology in high school and I was really really bad I'm like no idea what I'm doing in college just I didn't know what I want to do in my life and I really wasn't that great 
at anything. But it was one thing led to another. I took a lot of big steps. Um, so I started doing finance. I did work for New York Life. I was a personal banker. I did a lot of you know security and variables. I think it was a great learning experience for me, especially in the corporate structure, learning how the corporate politic, but really the organization, that skill that I got from it, the self-motivation like kind of skill. Because with the insurance part of it is that with the insurance, you really don't have a salary. You make what you close, the deals that you close, cold calling and talking to random people and being able to just put yourself out there. I think that was really great what I learned from it. On the weekends, and especially when I was in school, I always worked in Footbridge. So I was very, very interested in that and of opening up open restaurants and nightclubs and hotels. Eventually, I opened up my own restaurant and a private club in Los Angeles before I sold it and then got into tech investment. So I did a startup and then a lot of LA based tech companies before, you know, the Bay Area was pretty much all the tech incubators. And we did an incubator in Los Angeles that focused mostly on the uh, LA based startup companies. This is before Silicon Beach. Right now, there's an area in LA called Silicon Beach. This is before it was kind of that happened. Nowadays, so I just invest in a fund in out of Singapore actually called Teacher Ventures. I don't know if anybody's heard of it, but it's focused on investing in women tech companies. Right now, I'm still doing a little bit of that. I got into entertainment. I think when you live in LA long enough, you're going to make a lot of friends in entertainment. And because I know how to run business, how to start a lot of the corporate structures. And a really good friend of mine at the time named Jason Ma has a company called East West Artists. It managed some of the biggest talents in Asia and the US market. And we had a partnership with a, a big management company here called Untitled. So all Untitled clients we managed exclusively out in Asia. So that's when I really kind of jumped in both, you know, with my both my feet to the entertainment space and really learning the Asian representation and how important it is to have Asian representation in Hollywood. I was there for about three years. I was the managing partner for that company. The company was also a HTC portfolio company, which as an HTC V the headset. I started producing afterwards because when I realized that uh, talent management is great, but at the same time, building a business. When you build a business, there's different parts of the business. One kind of fails, you can kind of still run the business. With talent management, you're building everything around a talent. So if that talent doesn't want to work, your whole business kind of fails. So the guy don't really want to put my future and hard work kind of on someone else's you know, mood pretty much. They're yes or no's. So I start producing afterwards. I guess that's about it. It was kind of, it's been all over the place, but every single experience I've learned and it's helped me for my, the next chapter of my life. So amazing and so many different projects, but it's, as you said, you've transitioned so well, it sounds like them being able to take pieces from different experience. What do you like most about being an entrepreneur? I love the fact that you're working for yourself. So you're not having a nine to five job mm -hmm. on Saturdays. I might have to take meetings and nighttime I might have to take meetings, but I love that it's what you make of it. Um, and I think it's also very, very exciting because every day is different. I'm learning something new on every single project and you really have to control in a sense, right? You can control what you do. You know, obviously with entrepreneur, it also comes with with uh, the ups and downs, right? Because you, when you're working a corporate job and a salary job, it's a lot more stable than being an entrepreneur. But that's also, I think, very exciting about it as well. So, you know, have to be able to adjust and know that it's a wave. You got to ride a wave. Sometimes you might be down, but the next up is right there. And when you're a true entrepreneur, you can always make it up. So true. And thanks for sharing that. It's very... Uh... That's very um, empowering. Yeah. I mean, sure. I would say you are quite experienced and you have kind of like dived in a few like industries and stuff like that. I think that is something that I would want to explore as well to try out different things. And also, I kind of uh, realized that I love working for myself. I like managing my own schedule because I do have two kids. I realized like, you know, each time I put them off to bed after 10, that is where I start working. And I can't do that if I have like a fixed job. So that is something that I enjoy doing. So it's really fun. It's a whole new journey. Journey, right like you'll never know when it's like ups and downs when we were at our down times there will always be an uptime so that is really exciting yeah so right now like the market is down and then everybody's just like you know panicking and then it's, it's a whole mess right now but we will make through it i get so depressed every morning when i look at my ethereum <laughs> <laughs> yeah oh no yeah it's, it's horrible it's horrible yeah i just stopped looking at it right now i was like just wake me up at the next bull run <laughs> yeah so true like every day i'm like should i buy in more now and then i goes down further I'm like oh that's not good yeah I'll pay um, you when it's when it's a good time to look I'll say okay you can look now oh good yes thank you because way more experience in the crypto and the NFT so do do the do ping me uh, Kelly you you know your mental health advocate so maybe we can talk about your journey in terms of how do you get there and and why is that so important to you Literally my favorite topic to talk about recently. <laughs> Mental health has been such a new thing to me just because growing up in Asia and, you know, in the Asian family, we never, ever talk about mental health. Even that word had a, had a stigma to it, that it's bad. But mental health is just really your, your mental health, being kind of like your physical health. You know, I really hasn't discovered the mental health journey until in my 30s, in my like 30s. 
three, maybe when I started looking more into mental health. And I realized that, you know, I lived with myself for 30 plus years, but I really didn't even know myself. And I didn't really kind of dig deeper with myself until I started this journey, you know, this self discovery journey and learning more about myself. I realized so much. One of the things I think Asians can relate to is uh, not feeling good enough because growing up in a family that strives on perfection with my mom, you know, growing up anything short of a hundred is like a failure, you know? I, I remember I was telling my mom, cause, so 90 to 100 in the US is an A, so it's all the same. It's kind of the same grade. Like, wow, I got a 90. She's like, why don't you get a 100? I'm like, but it's the same thing. She's like, but you know, it's not the same. So nothing I do is ever good enough, but just the way that she, you know, she was taught as well. So then I kind of tend to over, I guess always try to value myself by other people's approval. I mean, that's just a little part of it. I can talk about this all day long, but spending the time getting to know myself is really the foundation of everything. So during that time, I had a lot of long time and I, I listened to a lot of podcasts, read a lot of books, went to therapy, watched YouTube, and my is so much better in every aspect of my life now because I spend time to get to know myself and take care of my mental health. And nowadays, I'm able to set clear boundaries as well as to listen to my body. So sometimes if I feel like my mind's a clutter or something, I know that I need to pause and reflect and think about the next step instead of just keep going, 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 going and just kind of basically running on empty all the time. I think for me, it's switched my life and perspective so much. That's why I'm so passionate in talking mental health. I mean, I can literally go on for a whole hour about this. So I'll stop right here. Oh, no, totally. No, that's that's great great you know overview and i do want to want to drill in a little bit more in terms of a lot of us resonate right with that in terms of always not feeling good enough it's not the 100 percent. i got 99 98 or something and seeking other people's approval when you're doing certain things so and there's always this expectation in terms of well what one should do or if you do it well you should do it in this direction and not change to this other direction so how did you really get that started right because it is hard even if you recognize like okay so do i take some downtime or so is there some recommended rituals or anything that you kind of recognize it and then start taking steps towards self-care i mean the first First thing is really education and awareness. Once you're aware, you're able to kind of change it, right? I have a lot of rituals and or routines that I do. So I have two cell phones. I think Nicole knows this. I have a phone that's on that has social media on there that you know has my email, has news, and all that stuff. That phone, I actually on the weekends I really don't look at and around about 8pm I kind of turn it off so I will have that you know hour two hours before bed to just kind of calm down and wind down um, my other phone is literally just text message you know my mom can message me call me all that stuff you know so I, I have that I mean it's a little extreme to have two phones but you can there's other ways around it obviously and also another thing is taking walks taking walks I, I love taking my, my dog on walks there's something about being in nature and away from distraction it's great and being your own thought as well Sundays I don't work so I, I train myself have a work life balance and that was another thing, you know, growing up in the Asian culture, it was very much, you have to work hard, work hard, work hard. And your accomplishment is, I guess, measured by success, by how much money you make. Where in today, I, I learned how to more work with a life, work-life balance. When, when I was in my 20s, I, I never shut off. If you email me at 2, 3 a.m., I'll probably respond. And, uh, you know, I was working 16 hours a day, seven days a week. I didn't know that self-care and taking time to refuel, because you can't pour from an empty glass. If you're not the version for yourself, you can't give the best version to others as well. So sure. So true. And how do you, I mean, it's still hard to kind of not worry about other people's comments, right? Especially those close to you. How do you further improve that mental health or just really kind of being in your own space? Of course, not like shutting off everyone, but like what is a nice way to, to do that and just being really aware and then just focusing on yourself? It's different when people you don't know write comments and say stuff. It's obviously closer to your heart when somebody close to you or people you care about. But at the end of the day, I think one of the things we have to remember is that we can only control ourselves. We can't control other people. I know that I did the best I could and I know I can sleep peacefully at nighttime that the rest of it I have to let go one of the things people can do and this is not just applied to this question but just more on all aspects of life is you know sometimes make when you're in a difficult situation or your mind's very confused or anything I, I write down two lists one list is things I can control in this situation the other stuff is things that I cannot control whatever you can't control just let it go what you can and then focus all your energy on things that you can control that's excellent advice so you used to travel a lot obviously during the pandemic it's quite difficult everything's on Paul's like are there favorite places and you know as part of the holistic you know also managing your mental health or just you know shutting off from other things but are there like type of places that you you gravitate towards more I love warm weather. I'm not a cold yes. cold weather person. So um, obviously in the U.S. it's really easy to, uh, to escape to Mexico. I love like Europe and Italy in the summer. Southeast Asia, just like that's where my heart is, you know. I'm actually heading back to Singapore in like three days. I'm so happy it opened up. So I wasn't, you know, before the pandemic, I was in Asia. Uh, there's a point I was in Asia once a month, if not like four times a year. So I'm just really excited to be back there. But I love, love, love Vietnam. Vietnam's been my new favorite. I, I, I kind of explore a new city kind of every single time. But like Hoi An is so beautiful. So I love stuff that has a lot of culture to it because I think a lot of these big cities sometimes lose its 
culture because it's so you know just malls and very okay it just it just it's loose to culture. i love eating like street food and very like getting to know local people so that's why you know hoi ans has a special place in my heart and singapore i think is just so beautiful and uh, it's safe that's also another thing that's really great it, right now in the u.s it's very very dangerous right now unfortunately even walking my dog sometimes i bring pepper spray with me no way yeah yeah crime rate is really bad right now especially with the asian hate crime it's really bad all across the u.s but i mean we see in the news but i do want to ask you is that how is that how you feel daily is, is it really getting that bad and- yeah la is not as bad because i think it's a little bit spread out but chicago san francisco china is really bad mm. chicago chinatown as well because my mom was in chicago that's why I, I know their news a little bit more and it's very unfortunate because a lot of time we actually don't really hear about ace that goes on the news just because mass media did cover it mm-hmm. they did mm-hmm. in mi- middle of the pandemic there was a height of it but they you know with the u.s after two weeks nobody really cared anymore right you get a lot of these news from a more asian focused uh news outlet and there's some reporters who do a really great job reporting um, asian hate crimes but it is still happening every single day stuff needs to be changed but not to get too political but our, our system is pretty broken that's really sad to hear just curious so have you ever like encountered a scenario where you know you got attacked or- yeah uh, fortunately for me i haven't had quote-unquote attack there's definitely been like racial slur that's that's been screamed out in car when i'm walking by with friends we came from my show I had a water bottle thrown at him again in wellywood which is a very nice area in los angeles unfortunately this this happens and these are the the light ones and there's ones that in new york and san francisco and chicago that um, people lost their lives this is insane that is really really sad to hear i'm really excited to be in singapore where i can walk you know around middle of the night and go get some street food yeah singapore is really safe i was there about like two weeks ago i love singapore it's like an upgrade of malaysia i might be actually going to malaysia i uh, our fund that i invested in singapore we invested this malaysian company is called green rebel so it's vegan meat so um we might oh, actually wow. make a trip out to, to malaysia we should meet I'll up you know. definitely yeah i'll let you know if i can yeah. find over there yay for sure i'll let you know <laughs> that is great that's so um, but it's so sad to hear about the you know other cities in new york because i mean u.s and because well i mean i'm planning a trip going to la and new york as well and it's always been a nice you know nice cities to go to before but um it's been two and a half years since the pandemic. I'm looking forward to it, but then I'm feeling a little bit worried because we'll just be more cautious. Yeah, as long as you're aware, I think yeah. it's okay. Kind of going back to the mental health, I mean, just how you balance so many projects, right? Like, how do you keep track? It really is structure and organization. <laughs> So, and then obviously team is, is so great. My assistant, like without her, I, I literally don't know what's going on. My calendar kind of runs my life. So I sound like I have it all together, but of course there's things that sl- still slips my mind and still get off my radar. It's just organization um, and just have structure in your life. So what are some of the upcoming projects? Especially, I think in mental health, you have quite a few like engagement or speaking engagement as well. But I mean, other projects coming up, you can speak a little bit to that as well. Yeah, my production company, we have a feature right now with a documentary in post and I have two projects in the pipeline to shoot this year. And obviously I think I just really want to focus on cost-based project and be a little bit more picky. I used to have a hard time saying no to things and I, I get myself into way too many things than I can handle. So now I've got to say no and picking a project that, that I'm passionate and that's cost-based and that's in line with uh, my vision. Also, you know, I do a lot of investment projects and I'm starting my own hot sauce brand actually uh, with my mom that I'm really excited about. I actually haven't haven't really uh, spoken about this. Thanks for letting me. So oh, we have an alpha. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We, we, so, will, um, we will blast it out for you. <laughs> not, not yet. We're still in the development stage. <laughs> but I'll definitely, hopefully can able to send you guys all a uh, jar soon. Uh, I had a company for over 10 years with developed brands, import export business, developed brands for a lot of celebrities and influencers. But I this is my first time developing a brand that's mine. So obviously I'm taking it a little bit slower than normal and I'm just really paying attention to it just because I grew up in Kuoming in the southern part of China and my mom always makes me this dish and she makes this hot sauce specially made and it's from a, a family recipe. But part of it is me wanting to build a closer relationship with my mom and be able to do a project with her together so we're building this hot sauce brand and um, it's very exciting so that hopefully we'll, we'll launch at the end of this year so amazing i love hot sauce so we'd love to see and taste your hot sauce there's so many varieties in in hong kong i mean in asia and china as you said different region i love tasting different ones so so looking forward to that and as soon as it's done i'll let you guys know and whoever <laughs> in the group wants one i will send you guys a jar i definitely want one <laughs> i want two and for the feature films uh, and documentary what what is the timeline when, when can we expect it just just curious when- yeah that should be um we're finishing a post right now so it should be in the next few months hopefully we find the distribution and then I'm also working on an, I think for my producing part of it at the beginning of my, my producing career I was really learning so my project's kind of all over the place but the ones that are in the pipeline that we're about to shoot is all very Asian centric it's all based on true stories there's so many incredible stories Asian American stories that's been told that so I just really want to focus
is my, my production company for, for the, you know, moving forward. Our focus is really just to be able to tell those stories. So I think that the ones that we're about to shoot, I think I, I would love in the future to share those with you guys once it's a little bit more polished. Looking forward to those. Great to hear that you're moving forward with the Asian, Asian American stories, representation. I think so important. There's so many stories out there that's mistold or not told. And so this is super exciting to hear. Any, uh, so with that, any final words from Nicole and Kelly? I really enjoyed this space. Um, I learned so much from Kelly and I think it's quite re- relatable that she said that when she was in her 20s, you know, even at 2 a.m., she would start replying emails and that's so me. Like my team members, sometimes they send me a message and they're like, Nicole, you don't sleep. And sometimes it's like 3 a.m. and I'll just reply them in an instant. So I feel that I do learn a, a lot and I do think I need two phones as well. I think that's a that's a life hack right there. My, my phone, the, no- the notification just can't stop ringing and sometimes if it's an important call, I'll just miss out as well. Yes, yeah, so I think I need two phones. I do enjoy this session. I'm really grateful, Kelly, for your time. I know that you are so busy. You know, I'm looking forward to see you in KL and also for your hot sauce. So true. So amazing. <laughs> yeah, I'm looking forward to that too. And thank you so much, Kelly, uh, for joining. And uh, it's a great conversation. Mm-hmm. So any final words from, from you and or final advice? Just thank you guys for having me here. Thanks, Joyce. Thanks, uh, Nicole, for being great hosts. And for everybody who is listening, you know, I, I think it's so important to build communities like this. So thank you for having me as part of it. Again, thanks. Uh, thank you, Kelly, for joining Nicole, co-hosting. Uh, thank you so much and stay tuned for the next one.